Hey everybody, it's Tom Cherry Holmes with the Fujinet Project, and I wanted to talk a few minutes and demonstrate where we are as far as being able to use encrypted protocols like SSH over the end device. HTTPS has been with us uh, over the end device for about six months now, and it's proven that you can indeed do crypto on the ESP32 quite comfortably and expose a nice clean channel to the Atari I.O. system. We're taking this a bit further, and what I've essentially done is port libssh2 uh, to run over on the ESP32 and built a protocol adapter to actually utilize it. And to demonstrate this, we will actually take and log into my Raspberry Pi. And we'll do this initially over 40 columns here. We don't change anything just yet. Uh, and we'll use our trusty little uh, tool called Netcat. Now, if we run NC by itself here, we'll see that it uh, gives us a little command line here showing us OK. Uh, since I'm running this under Sparta DOS X, it's like, OK, in device, protocol, host, port, path, etc. Um, for SSH connections, we use SSH as the protocol identifier. And the host of my Raspberry Pi is, well, Raspberry Pi. And uh, SSH nominally over port 22. Now I did make a change just now to take and set the default path uh, port to port 22. So by the time you guys start using this, you won't have to add that. And well, since we are dealing with a non-Atari host, adding CRLF here will allow you to see the line endings correctly. And with that, we'll actually take and log on to the box. Now you'll notice on the right hand side of the screen here, we have a uh, sort of a debugger window that comes up with the FujiNet flasher. I'm doing this so you can see what goes on behind the scenes when the SSH connection starts. And actually, uh, I need to do one more thing before we start here. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself we will uh, actually log on. We will take and provide a set of credentials uh, that the uh, end device will use when talking to the SSH protocol adapter. And we'll use the end login tool for this. End login takes uh, three parameters. The first is the device name. Then the second is the username that you want to use and then the password. And so with that, now we can do this. And we'll see right here, immediately you see there's an RSA fingerprint, the key negotiation happens, and without any further ado, we're actually, uh, we're actually talking to our Raspberry Pi over an encrypted link. And you'll see that this works out quite well. Um, there are some interesting little quirks here. Uh, the biggest thing right now is that there is no terminal emulation with Netcat whatsoever. Everything is coming across and it's being interpreted by the Atari Ataski terminal emulation with some basic ASCII translation happening in the meantime. So, I mean, even with that though, it's still okay and it's still usable. We can, of course, hit Control D on a Linux host to disconnect and everything will come back as normal. Now, the reason that uh, I wrote tools like NC and the like to uh, actually just use the editor device is because it allows you to use whatever console driver that you wish to use, such as uh, the RC uh, GR8 graphics driver to provide 80 column text to use Netcat here, for example, we'll go back in again. And we'll see that uh, the display is a lot nicer here when we have 80 columns to work with here. So this means that if you have a VBXC and you have a VBXC driver, that will work just fine. If you use the ACE80 cartridge, uh, that will work just fine. Again, we're outputting to uh, the screen handlers. So 
whatever abstraction you wish to use to get your 80 columns, it will work. So XEP80, same thing. And that's why I'm spending time here. Is it slower than writing directly to screen memory? Absolutely. But given that uh, FujiNet itself has a lot, of, uh, a lot of input and output memory to begin with, this isn't that big of an issue. Now, I will say that there seems to be some interesting bugs with the, uh, with the uh, console handler under Sparta DOS X that I hope get fixed. But even with that, you can see it's still very much, very much usable. Boom, 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 and so on. Now, I'm going to go ahead and control D here, and I'm going to change a few of my settings. Let's go ahead and make sure I'm here. Disable Sparta DOS X for a moment. I'm going to reset my FujiNet and put in a copy of my uh, Ace 80 cartridge here. Temporarily, I need to deactivate my video capture device for just a moment. And with this, oop, hold on, it seems that it didn't just die. Okay, hold start. Thank you. Let's try that again. Here we go. Bam. Let's reactivate once the screen comes up. And we have a copy of Ace 80 here. Now, um, I realized that I did this all backwards, but give me a moment. Because Sparta DOS X kind of tripped over ourselves here. We're going to go ahead and mount a copy of Netcat over from networking here and use the Ace80 cartridge to do the same thing that we just did over in Sparta DOS X. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring ourselves back into Cold Start for just a moment. Looks like I'm actually going to have to kill the machine in order to re-enable the AS80 cartridge. Give me just a moment. Yep. This thing is very, very, very finicky as to when it decides it wants to activate and deactivate. Fun times. So there we go. So you can see, since we're using the standard E device here, and we're booting in a non-CLI DOS, it goes into interactive mode to do much the same thing. Uh, so translation default, OK, no local echo. Now, I added some parameters here so that you could set the username here as well. And once again, we find ourselves here inside of Ace 80. And it's just bouncing along just fine. There seems to be slight differences in the console drivers, which I have to take and work with, but this is the nature of it right here. But this is a completely encrypted channel, uh, all the way up to all the way up to the FujiNet, which is then sending a nice clean. IO channel into the Atari. And because this actually runs under in, what this essentially means, I'm going to take and kill this again, uh, is that you can utilize this anywhere that you utilize the end device. So that means we'll put our hard, drive, hard disk guy. Uh, image back in again. Flip on Sparta DOS X. Bam. And I'm going to load the end handler here so that I can use this from inside of basic. Boom. 
and you'll find that I have right here, in addition to nc.com, I have nc.basic, which is kind of the equivalent program, but in basic using the end device, the CIO handler. We'll go into basic. And we'll find right here that we have our SSH. Now, I actually need to take and set the login credentials as before. I haven't tested login and password setting through the CIO handler yet, and I don't want to do that on a demo, but it should work. <laughs> but we'll do it here regardless. Oops. And we'll see that again, this is much like the dumb terminal example that you've seen in other videos here, except this time we're actually opening up an SSH connection using the SSH adapter and then treating it like another IO channel here. And again, much the same thing. So, I mean, there you go. I mean, this should really open up ideas and possibilities. Now, I will say that um, there are a couple of things that I want to do. Uh, particularly, I want to add support for SCP, which will be trivial, and I want to add support for SFTP. Now, with both of these things, what that essentially means is that you'll be able to transfer files, do list the disk directories, etc., of remote hosts, and copy the files to and from that host back to and from the Atari in an encrypted manner. Because the ESP32 is handling all the crypto, doing all the heavy lifting and making sure that it's exposing a nice clean IO channel uh, to the Atari. So, um, you know, it's uh, lots of interesting possibilities here as well as providing the file system abstraction so that it looks like a typical Atari file system on the Atari side of things. It's doing a lot of heavy lifting there and there's still a lot of work to do there. But I also need to take and port this from libssh2 and use libssh instead. Because right now, libssh2 still defaults to using a, a deprecated key exchange algorithm when the preauthorization process starts. What this ultimately means is I had to change my sshd config file so that it would be able to log to enable the deprecated cipher so that it would be able to log on. Now this doesn't uh, affect after the authentication process because it uses AES uh, 256 after the authentication process. This is wholly the initial key exchange process. They've changed that up. They've made a better key exchange algorithm in the last year and a half uh, to two years and uh, all of the major versions of SSHD that now ship with versions of Linux now take and deprecate the old cipher and make you use the new ones. So, sorry. But I digress. There's still things that need to be done, but it's here to show you that this is possible and that um, uh, this is possible. It's in master if you want to, and it's in master if you want to play with it. It will be rolled out into the next builds, and if you guys want to actively use it, then great. I also want to take and point out too that I need some help because there are, uh, if you saw in my disk directory here, uh, there are in addition to the NC, there's also uh, an ADM3A and a VT100 emulator. They work in the same way as Netcat. They're command line uh, applications that, that become interactive when you're not running under a command line. And they just provide the terminal emulation hooked up to the end device so that you can quickly jump into a host using a particular terminal type. And I really could use some help there with that if anybody could help. So with that, I'm going to leave this video here right at the 15 minute mark. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. And as always, until next time, have fun.